For sake of time, we're, we're not going to read it again today. We're just going to jump right into it. So we, we talked extensively about come up hither. That is indicating to us the, the time frame in the book of Revelation when the rapture will happen. John is transported from Patmos on earth into the third heaven in what is often called the throne room. Now it says that uh, when he's making this, this, when he's traveling up there, a door was open. Now, yeah, let's look at it. Let's look at it quickly. Turn to John 10. Always keep your place in Revelation, but turn to John 10. And this is very interesting. John 10, verse seven, verses 7 through 9. Make sure you're reading along with me. Verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So we, we, we get this beautiful picture during John's rapture up to heaven. What reason is there to say that he passed through a door? <laughs> you better pass through that same door. Jesus Christ is the way. Now let me illustrate that to you even further. Get two places. Get Genesis. So go to first while you're in John. Get John chapter 1. And get Genesis 28. 
John 1 and Genesis 2 and Genesis 28. Genesis 2 and Genesis 28. So, I'm going to show you the desire of man's heart. If he would admit to it. Verses 10 through 12. Genesis 28, verses 10 and 12. Verse 10. Verse 10. Verse 10. Verse and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and he lay down in that place to sleep. Now, stop right there. That's so cool, my God. Jacob has made a complete mess of his life. He's often noted as being somewhat of a con artist in the Bible. Now he's tricked his brother Esau. Esau. But Esau will kill him. Esau will kill him. Esau is a mighty hunter. So Jacob says, I got to run. <laughs> And he's running and running and trying to get away from his brother. And night falls. And he finds a place he just wants to lay down and get some rest. And he takes a couple of rocks and uses them for his pillow. And so this man whose life is troubled and, and, and he's on the run. He has a dream. What does he dream about? Look at verse 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So this man lays down, and in all his turmoil, he has a dream. And he dreams about a way to heaven. He sees this ladder that goes up to heaven. And he sees angels descending and ascending and descending upon this ladder. That is the desire of every man's heart. They might be confused about how to get to heaven. They might be confused about how to be reconciled to God. But this is what they want. Now look at John 1. And verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Uh, thou shalt see greater things than these, verse 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, that matches Jacob's dream. Jacob is dreaming of a way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven. He saw angels ascending and descending upon that ladder. Jesus is that ladder. You'll get to heaven no other way. You can dream about it. You can imagine it. But unless you trust in Christ, you're not going. And so we see this door is open in heaven. Jesus is that door. Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is the way. Without him, that you, you have nothing. All right, now he says in Revelation 2, uh, 4, that he was immediately in the spirit. And, and of course, he is essentially raptured as far as we can tell. And this is a picture of what will happen to us and, and how these things will take place. Now, now, again, we noted yesterday that he said all this took place after this, the end of the church age, the, the end of the dispensation of grace, 
And when he gets to heaven, a throne was set in heaven. Now, the wording makes it sound like heaven is built around this throne. Now, notice he goes up to heaven, but that's not what he's talking about. He's in heaven. But he's not telling you about heaven. You get a few bits and pieces here and there about heaven. You get a few bits and pieces, a few minor details about heaven. But he's looking at that throne. And the reason heaven might be built around the throne is because the one who sits on that throne is preeminent. Now look in your place there. We, we read this yesterday. If you need to be, uh, you know, make yourself familiar with it again, read it again during the break. He begins to describe the throne and the person sitting on it. Remember that? Now hold your place here and look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel had a vision of this same throne. We'll read verses 26 through 28. <clears throat> Verse 26. Uh, and above the firmament that was over their heads was a likeness of a throne as the appearance of, sapp of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, uh, 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 from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about as the appearance of the, of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. That is almost exactly what John describes in Revelation chapter 4. He's looking at that throne and, and the only way he can describe it is it looks like the, the, the shining of precious stones and precious metals. Now, this is what's important about this throne. Chapters 4 and 5 are preparation for judgment. So that's what this throne is for. It is a throne of judgment. So Revelation is fast moving. But you get these occasional pauses. Between yeah. judgments and between all, all the events that are going on. So we, in chapter 1, we get this vision of Jesus Christ. In chapters 2 and 3, we get these letters to the seven churches. The church is raptured into heaven. And we're looking at the throne. In chapters 4 and 5, we get this brief pause where they describe the throne and then the one on the throne begins to open the books. And he begins to break the seals. And trouble like you've never seen breaks out on earth. 
This is all building up to that. This is all preparation for that. And you especially see that in chapter 5. Because we'll see that in just a minute, but we have the book. And John is weeping because nobody can open this book. And they tell him, weep not. The Lamb hath prevailed. He can open the book. And then he does. And if you belong to Jesus Christ, this would be a good time to thank him. When that book is opened, this world has no idea what trouble looks like yet. Not compared to what's coming. Now, verse 5 says, you know, in, in, uh, in a link to judgment, verse 5 says, lightnings and thunderings came from this throne. God often used lightnings and thunderings in conjunction with judgment. Hold your place in Revelation 4 and look at Exodus 9. Quickly. Exodus 9, verse 23. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and the fire ran along upon the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So God is judging Egypt. Look at Exodus 19. As he's judging Egypt, thunder and, and, and hail and fire are involved. Exodus 19, verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. God is not happy with Israel. But you see that his, his anger is, is related directly to thunders and lightning. So we're getting pre prepared for this judgment that's about to come. Look at verse 4, Revelation 4. Verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. That's representative of us. That is the body of Christ sitting before the throne. Not concerned at all about the coming judgments. If you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you have escaped God's wrath. You have escaped God's judgment. These elders are sitting there perfectly comfortable. Now, I want to show you some characteristics that help lend to the, to the fact that I believe this is the, the, the body of Christ, this is the church. Look at Revelation 3, verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now we understand that salvation is also direct, uh, is, is linked to your name being written in the book of life. If your name's not there, you're not going. 
But here's a group of people whose names are written in that book. They will not be blotted out. And they're dressed in white raiment. Just like the elders in Revelation 4. Let's see it again in Revelation 19. Revelation 19 verses 5 through 8. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Who is, who is his wife? We are. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The church. We are his bride. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. So that is the body of Christ. Look at, turn back to Revelation 3 again. These elders in Revelation 4 are wearing crowns. Revelation 3 verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Now, we, we said yesterday that the Lord said, I am coming quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Look at verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. That's where the elders are sitting. The Lord is seated on his, seated on his throne. And the elders are seated right there with him. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So th these elders, they are the body of Christ. 1 <laughs> uh, Corinthians 6, 2, we're not going to turn there for, for sake of time. Some other things to look at. But it says the saints will judge the earth along with the Lord. We will rule and reign with Christ. So again, we get to just kind of hang out there and... <laughs> And enjoy it all. The benefits of trusting in Jesus Christ are infinite. I hope you are 100% certain you have done that. Now look at Daniel 7. Still talking about these elders. Verse 9. Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10. Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Daniel, verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. That, that great multitude are people out of every kindred and tongue from the every nation under earth. And they're sitting before the Lord as he's preparing for judgment. We get to minister to him as he gets ready to come down here and, and cause a few problems. Now, these elders have crowns on. Be through, through your service to Jesus Christ in this life, you can earn rewards in heaven. And, and some of those rewards are crowns. 
There are five crowns noted in the Bible that you can earn. And, and the Bible gives the indication that Christ wants you to be zealous and to work to earn these crowns. Everybody wants to work to earn salvation. Sorry. Everybody wants to work to earn salvation. That's not an option. Christ finished that work. Yes, Christ. You gotta trust in Christ to obtain salvation. After you do that, Christ wants you to earn these crowns. Now I'm going to read them off to you. We don't have time to go look at them all. But you can get you can get the idea from 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. 1 Corinthians 3 11 through 15. 1 Corinthians 3 11 through 15. These present to you the idea that Christ wants you to earn these things. Earn these rewards in heaven. If you want to labor for something, why not get saved and then go labor for that? <laughs> the, one thing, the one thing you cannot earn is what everybody wants to work for. Now the five crowns. Number one is an incorruptible crown. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians 9. Verses 25 to 27. The next one is the crown of life. You can find that in Revelation 2, verse 10. The next one is the crown of glory. You can find that in 1 Peter 5, verses 2 through 4. The next one is the crown of righteousness. That's 2 Timothy um, 4. Verse 8. And the last one is a crown of rejoicing. That's 1 Thessalonians 2. 19 through 20. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Everybody get those? Everybody need me to repeat it? Of course, Ronald needs me to repeat it. All right, the first one was the incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 to 27. Anybody else? Everybody got everybody that wants well, to All right, now these elders in heaven, they're wearing crowns. And, it, and eventually they get the opportunity to cast those crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about this. The Lord wants you to work here and now to earn these crowns. And then you get the opportunity to give them right back to him. Wouldn't it be a little embarrassing to have nothing to throw at his feet? Just kind of be standing there like... Sure wish I would have done something with my life. <laughs> So don't be that person. So no less to be that one. Now turn back to Revelation uh, five. They sang a song that, that just further proves who they are. Look at this quickly. Revelation five and verses eight through ten. Verse eight, and and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Who was redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ? We are. 
The body of Christ. Jesus Christ. These 20 and 4 elders are representative of the body of Christ. That multitude of people out of out of every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. Now, you put all this together, we've been talking about. If you go all the way back to Philadelphia, we had the King James Bible. Out of that came the missionary movements around the world. And because the word of God spread all over the world, and this idea of missions was, was formulated and put together. Brother Keith came here. Planted the churches that are here. Led many of you to Christ. And then many of you led others here to Christ. And because of that, every one of you that are act, that are saved, we will be together at the foot of that throne. That's going to be an incredible day. I hope you're excited about it. Now, Back in Revelation 4, there's a sea before the throne. And it's said to be a sea of glass. I want to see that. I want to see that. That's got to be an incredible sight. But in Revelation 15, verses 2 through 4, this sea of glass is mingled with fire. This kind of gives us a picture of the calm before the coming storm. Now it's interesting that this sea is before the throne. In 1 Kings chapter 7, verses 23 through 45, there was a brazen sea before, before the, the temple. In what? the temple, before the Ark of the Covenant, before all, uh, you know, all these things that are representative of God's presence on earth. All right, now, we're going to turn a good bit of our attention to verses 7 through 11. Let's read them quickly. And the first piece was like a lion. Uh, go back to verse 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were, they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, these four beasts, we have in the Bible, cherubim, seraphim, and angels. Now, the similar idea is repeated in Isaiah um, my brain is stuck uh, um, 6, 1 through 4 cherubim are repeated in so, Ezekiel uh, 1, 1 1 through 10. Identical creatures to what we just read in Revelation. Uh, chapter now, I, I taught 
I'm, I'm going to show you an idea that I taught in our Sunday school class. And it gives you, it, it helps further illustrate to you. You should always be looking for Jesus Christ in every passage. Now these passages give the idea that these creatures surround the throne crying out, holy, holy, holy. Continually. They don't stop. And this passage we just read said that 20 and 4 elders, every time they do that, they fall down at the Lord's feet and cast their crown at his feet. So, we get to do that over and over and over to honor, to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. Alright, so now, these beasts, one has the face, of, or one, they, they, each beast has four faces. Four beasts with four faces. One had the face of a lion, one has the face of an ox or a calf. One the face of a man. And the face of an eagle. These four faces are representative of the person, character, and work of Jesus Christ. A lion represents a king. Is Jesus a king? An ox represents a servant. Jesus is a man. So omuntu and the eagle is representative of God. Now, it's interesting that the four beasts have four faces. And we have four gospels. Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews. That's the primary focus of Matthew. Mark presents Jesus as a servant. When you read the book of Mark, it's and, 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 and. It's just continually moving. As a, as a servant, he never gets to take a break. Luke presents Jesus as the man Christ Jesus. And in John, he is the word that presents his deity. Now, four beasts, four presentations of Jesus Christ, he is a king, which is representative of the lion, he is a servant, which is the ox, he is a man, and he's God. Now let me show this, show this to you. And we're going to have to go through this quickly. Wait, what time do we stop? 9.30, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we got... We're, we're okay. Revelation 5.5. 5. Revelation 5.5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals. Who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus Christ. Yes, mwene. All right, look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30. Verses 29 through 30. 
There be three things which go well. Yea, four are comely and going. A lion, which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. Mm -hmm. Proverbs, that is Proverbs 30, verses 29 through 30. Get our salam. I said, I'll be a moment when that I sat already to be in this. So a lion doesn't back down for anybody. Jesus Christ came to this earth yes, and went straight to the, to the cross. All right, next we have the calf or the ox. Turn to 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5. Verse 18. Verse Timothy 5 and verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. That, that idea is repeated in 1 Corinthians 9, 9. What do you use a ox for? He's a, he's a beast of burden. You use him to work. Uh, look at Proverbs 14. <coughs> Proverbs 14, verse 13. Verse 13. If I can find Proverbs. Proverbs 14 and verse 4. Uh, Proverbs 14, 4. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. So Proverbs 14, 4. So an ox is a servant. It's a beast of burden. Philippians 2 says Jesus Christ made himself a servant. On the cross he said it is finished. The work he came to do is finished. He said I work the works of my father. My, my father worketh hitherto, so, so do I. Alright, next is the man. 1 Timothy 2, verse 15. Verse 15. Verse 15. Verse 15. Verse 15. Verse 15. Not, notwithstanding, that's not what I need. Um, what did I do? Five? Did I do that again? Yes, that's it. Verse five. It's Jesus' fault. <laughs> For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and men, the man Christ Jesus. Yes, Christ. All right, so let's, I have to do that again. So. There is one, one man, so Mary can't help you. The Pope can't help you. The priest can't help you. This idea is repeated in Hosea 11, verse 12. Hosea 11, 4. Uh, it says, we're not going to turn there. It says he... He draws the nation of Israel with the cord of a man. So the man Christ Jesus drew the nation of Israel. And he is our mediator. Now I'll turn to Proverbs 30. Next he is the eagle. His his deity is represented by an eagle. Proverbs 30, verses 18 through 19. There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not, the way of an eagle in the air, 
the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. So when you think of an eagle in the air, he's got this, this view of the earth from heaven. So that's Proverbs 30, 18. And it's repeated in Proverbs 23, 5. Proverbs, let's say 30, 18, 19. Okay. So these are the faces of the four beasts. But they represent the character and the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to I help further bring that idea together. Turn to Exodus 26. You're going to get two, two places. Get Hebrews 10. And Exodus 26. Hebrews 10. And Exodus 26. We're going to kind of tie these together. And I hope it will be a blessing Now you're getting the condensed version of this teaching. You're getting the condensed version of this teaching. Exodus 26 verses 31 through 33. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittle wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. And thou shalt hang the veil under the tatches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Now turn to Hebrews 10. So this is what you have. You have this, this veil. And the veil is hanging on four pillars. And back here you have the holy place. And this veil is meant to keep man out of there. It's used to divide, to keep you away from being able to get into yeah, where, to where the Ark of the Covenant is to where God is. So in the Old Testament, man had to stay out of there. Only the priest, the high priest could go in there and only at certain times. So this veil is meant to keep man if you went into this area, that veil was your protection. If you went back there and you were not supposed to be back there, God himself would strike you dead. You had to make sure your hands were clean. Your heart was clean. Your mind was clean. And you had to make sure it was an acceptable time for you to be in there. And if you were not the high priest, you never got to go in there. But something changed. Look at Hebrews 10. Verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So, in the Old Testament, you could not go back here. Now God is telling you, I want you to enter the holiest place through the blood. I want you to do it boldly through the blood of Jesus. So because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you can go straight to the throne of God with no hesitation. Look at verse 20. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. 
Okuita mujiji, ejiji yu 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 and the New Testament is the flesh of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, that veil was rent. That veil was rent. And torn apart. Exposing the holiest of holies. And now it's available to everybody who will trust in Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting. This veil, that is to say, his flesh, is hanging on four pillars. If you want to know Jesus Christ, you've got to have the four Gospels. He's a king. He's a servant. He's a man. And he's God. If you want to know Jesus Christ, you've got to have all four pillars. Alright, that ends chapter 4. Go back to Revelation. Chapter 5. All right. Let's read chapter 5, verses 1 through 14, the whole chapter. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was, able, was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Man couldn't even look at the book. <inaudible> much less open it. And, that, and it just made John weep. Verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, <clears throat> which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou, hast, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's a <laughs> That's a lot of people. You know how many that is? You don't have a clue how many that is. It's a massive multitude of people from every place on earth that trusted in Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard us saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So, just reading these two chapters, 
You get the idea that we're going to do a lot of worshiping of the Lamb in heaven. Now, if you don't worship Him now, you're not going to like heaven. If you don't get excited to go to church and worship God and hear His word, you're going to hate heaven. See, when you ask somebody, don't you want to go to heaven when, they, when you die? Like, of course I do. Because in their mind, heaven, heaven is this place where they kick back on a hammock and they have a mansion, and they just get to relax and do nothing. They've got somebody catering to them. They have imagined what they think heaven is. And of course they want to go to the place they imagine heaven is. That throne is surrounded by heaven, which is filled with people that he saved, and we repeatedly fall at his feet and worship him. We sing songs to him, we thank him, we praise him, we worship him, because he is worthy. You think about all the things you give your loyalty to and you give your time to. You give your attention to. How does it compare to what we just read? To Jesus Christ. In his glory on his throne. The one who washed you in his blood. The one who redeemed you from, from, from the earth. If it doesn't compare, then why don't you why don't you give more time to Jesus Christ to whatever you're giving your time to? Why don't you give more thought and attention to Jesus Christ than whatever it is you're spending your time on? There's no comparison. And whatever you're spending your time on here that is not related to Jesus Christ. It's going to perish. But you could earn rewards that will last into heaven. From Jesus Christ. And you get to repeatedly take those rewards. And you just cast them at his feet. You just give them to him over and over. He gave them to you in the first place. Alright, so... Someone had to be worthy. That someone has to be the person who, who was able to mediate between God and man. Man, man. Men and angels couldn't touch that book. There was one specific person who was worthy. Adam's sin caused man to lose the inheritance. We lost our dominion over earth. We lost everlasting life. And we lost fellowship with God. Through Adam's sin. Somehow this had to be restored. Adam's possession of earth was given to Satan. But even that will be redeemed. Jesus Christ first comes and redeems man. We go through the tribulation. And at the end of it all, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, this is really not that important, I don't think, but I guess I'll mention it just because. You have a lot of people in the world and coming to Africa who want to save the earth. <laughs> it sounds like a beautiful, we're going to save the earth. You're not going to save the earth. God 
himself is going to burn this place down. So you're not going to destroy the earth and you're not going to save the earth. Now if you'll be a good steward of the earth, if you'll be a good steward of the earth, it might be a more comfortable place to live. If you throw trash everywhere and you treat earth like a dump, then that's how you're going to live. In a dump. But it's not going anywhere until God himself decides to burn it down. And he is going to burn it down. Now let's look at this quickly. Someone had to redeem things. Someone had to redeem man. Adam lost the earth. Someone had to be worthy to redeem it. But who could redeem man and the earth? According to the Bible, it had to be a kinsman redeemer. Had to be one of us. But none of us can do it. So God made himself a man and did it for us. Look at Leviticus 25. We'll do this as quickly as we can. 23 to 24. 20, uh, Leviticus 25. Verses 23 through 24. I can find Leviticus. All right. 25 verses 23 through 24. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor and had sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which is his that which his brother sold. Only your brother, your kinsman, can redeem what you have lost. Look at Hebrews chapter two. We got to go quickly. I got Ten minutes. Hebrews two. Verses 14 through 18. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who, who through, their, through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, listen to verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, it, it, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest uh, in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So because he became a man and he went through this process and he came like his brethren, he is able to redeem the earth and to redeem man. Look at First Peter, chapter one, verse Peter one, verses eighteen and nineteen. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. Jesus Christ. Christ to Jesu. First Peter 1, what were the verses? Uh, 18 and 19, or through 20. 
He is the redeemer and you get this this idea all comes together. We're not going to turn there but you can read about it more. In Ruth 4 1 through 12. Now this is what's important about this passage. The kinsman redeemer had to go to the gate of the city where the elders were seated. Who is seated before the throne in heaven in front of Jesus Christ? 24 elders after this so, he's going to come back and redeem the earth. He's going to destroy it first. <laughs> but then he is going to redeem it. All right. In verses 6 through 14, they're looking for someone. Everybody got this that needs it? Okay, everybody. <laughs> All right, in verses 6 through 14, <clears throat> they named the person who is worthy to open the book. Now, we read what John saw in chapter 1 when he had a vision of Jesus Christ. Brazen feet, long white robe, that seems like that was a year ago. His eyes are as a flame of fire, hair white as wool, white as snow. It's just this, this beautiful figure. But in chapter 5, when he looked at who was on the throne, it was a lamb as it had been slain. This, this makes Christ worthy. He paid for it. God promised him, his father promised him, if you'll go pay for this with your blood, I'll give it all to you. Now, now let's think about this. Through his blood, we are redeemed. We get rewards and inheritance and crowns. And then we get to sit before the Lord in heaven and cast that, those rewards to, to his feet. Well, we read when the Lord is finished with the heaven and earth. Sorry? When the Lord is finished with heaven and earth. When everything is complete. He's going to give it back to his father. He's not doing anything. We're not doing anything that he himself is not going to do. All right, now that's chapter five. There's five minutes left. I want to set Brother Keith up and let him take off running from there. As soon as chapter five ends, we enter into Daniel's 70th week. Daniel. There's a lot I would like to show you about this, but that is reserved for another. It's also called the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, I'm not bringing this up to, to step into his territory or, or my bounds. The reason for it is the, the details surrounding Daniel's 70th week or Jacob's time of trouble or Jacob's trouble further prove the church will not be there. All right, so you, find, you can read about these in 
Jeremiah 37. And I'm sure Brother Keith is going to probably go to a lot of these questions. If not all of them, Daniel 20, uh, 24 or 20 through 24, actually 20 through 27. Daniel 9. One through three and then many other places. Now, this is this is the point. There's a purpose for Daniel's 70th week. The first purpose is to finish the transgression. Which one? Daniel 9 1 to 3. Oh, what did I write? What did I write? No, Daniel 9. I have a new Bible. <laughs> Daniel 9. Thank you. Um, Daniel 9. Daniel 9. Thank you. To finish the transgression. Now, I'm not going to teach these. I don't know how much of this Brother Keith is going to This is what I want you to think about. Who paid for your transgression? Who? Jesus. Yes, Christ. So why would your transgression need to be finished? The second reason for it is to make an end of sins. Who paid for your sins? Yes. So why would there need to, why would there be a need to make an end to your sins? Number three is the is reconciliation for iniquity. Are you reconciled to Christ? Are you reconciled by Christ to God? Number four is to bring everlasting righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. The moment you're saved. Number five is to seal the vision. And that's going to take place through the book of Revelation. And number six is to anoint the most holy. None of those have anything to do with the body of Christ. That is all directly related to Daniel's people and Jacob, which is Israel. Israel.